This PowerPoint is about curriculum and standards or what you're going to teach as a teacher. So let's talk first about curriculum and what is curriculum. Curriculum is all the stuff that gets taught in schools. What is actually broadcast or what students actually learn in schools. So let's take a look at these questions or the goals of curriculum. First, what are the educational purposes? What educational purposes should the school seek to obtain? What do we want our kids to know? What are our learning objectives, in other words? Two, what educational experiences can be provided that are likely to attain those purposes? How do we get our kids to get those objectives? What teaching strategies are you using? What's your plan or what do you do to teach? How can these educational experiences effectively be organized? What activities are you going to do? What are the kids going to be engaged in so that they learn your objectives or those educational purposes? And four, how can we determine whether these purposes are being attained? How are you going to assess what you want the students to learn? How are you going to assess if they have learned anything? How do you know? So those four questions help guide when you're creating your curriculum, when you're thinking about what is being taught and what is being learned in your classroom and your school. So there are different approaches to curriculum or what students need to know and how they should learn it. These approaches can be found on page 183 on your textbook. And as you're hearing about them and reading about them, think about which one are you? Because how you view learning which of these four ways you view learning is going to affect what you teach and how you teach it. So let's start with humanist perspectives or humanist approaches. Humanists believe that a liberal arts uh, teaching and learning is the best way to get those basic fundamental academic disciplines, history, English, math, and the sciences, and maybe some other fields of study like foreign languages or art or music, but getting those basic what people need to know for their lives. The second group are developmentalists, and this is where grade levels come from, that there are different points in time where students are able to comprehend or need to know certain information. So we break them into different groups based on age, and then at that developmental stage, you teach certain concepts or certain ideas. Uh, the next group are the social efficiency educators, and you can see a lot of our American system in this, but the point of a social efficiency education is to be a factory of learners, to provide the most efficient way to educate future workers uh, that meet the needs of the national economy, to meet the needs of the nation and have enough workers in different parts. So you're sorting students out and you're teaching directly what they need to know. And finally, the fourth group are social meliorists, that's a difficult word to say, or social constructionists, that's a little bit easier. But these social constructionists believe that school curriculum should prepare students to be uh, citizens of a society, not just the workers of a society, but citizens. So they need to know those basic skills, history, English, math, but they also need to learn certain dispositions on how to be good citizens. So as you're thinking about that, which one do you think and how does that affect what is taught in schools? You can see the different approaches to curriculum based on the history of American education. So let's take a brief look at the history of American education. First, there was the space race of the 1950s and 60s, which was this idea that America and the Soviet Union at the time were racing to get an astronaut into space. And in order to win that race, we needed our students to be good at math and science. So math and science became huge dominating subjects in education, and we needed to be first at math and science. Well, then we won the space race, 
but people started having a little bit of a backlash to all that emphasis on math and science. We have a ton of people being trained to be mathematicians and scientists, but what about other fields? So then in the 70s, this idea of career education came in. This idea that we need to be preparing students to have careers when they get out of school, not just to help the U.S win a race to space, but really help them to have successful careers. So it became a focus of picking different tracks to go on, kind of choosing, uh, do you want to be heavy in math? Do you want to have more English classes? And this is mostly at the secondary level. So students were getting to pick and choose a little bit of the courses they want. And again, there was a backlash to that. If you think about the history, it's a pendulum. It goes from one way, it swings one way, and then it counterbalances and swings the other way. And it's hardly ever centered into the middle. So the backlash to career education was back to basics, that students need the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and that's what they need, and we need to focus on those basic skills and make sure everyone has those basic skills which worked for a while and then the pendulum swung and in the 90s uh, people were saying but wait we're treating kids like they're machines they're not learning how to be people so the pendulum swung to include more social emotional education how to self-regulate how to feel good about yourself a lot of emphasis on having self-esteem and high self-esteem well again the pendulum swung to standards-based education starting about 2000 and this is when No Child Left Behind became enacted and standards-based education is similar to the back to basics that there are certain basic skills that kids need but it went a step further and said well there's not just basic needs but here are exactly the basic needs here are the standards that you need to follow and we are going to test every student to make sure they're meeting those basic requirements. And then still in effect, but a new uh, swing is school choice. This movement towards vouchers and charter schools and different specialty schools so that parents and students can choose what the emphasis should be. So it's kind of in the middle, but it's still uh, swinging one way or the other, but school choice al al is supposed to allow parents and students to choose the emphasis of the education, basic skills or career education or religious education, and that's where we are today. So far I've discussed curriculum as in formal curriculum or what is written down and stated that we need to be teaching kids. But there's also an idea of a hidden curriculum or informal or indirect ways of teaching students. So hidden curriculum is the indirect ways in which schooling socializes students to the values and norms of society. That is brought about by the culture of the school, the culture of the uh, community where the school is, society at large, policies that influence the school. All these things teach students how they're supposed to act, how they're supposed to be as people, as citizens of a certain group or society. These, this hidden curriculum is not necessarily written down anywhere or even vocalized by anyone, but it's some of those things that uh, are, get passed on through schools. Another area that might be formal or informal education is multicultural education. So here are some questions for you to think about. Why was multicultural education introduced in the first place? Do we still need to be even talking about multicultural education? Is multicultural education for everyone? Well, first, why was it introduced? Well, you've already read um, earlier in your textbook about the diversity of our schools. And that diversity was not represented in the curriculum. It was a bunch of old white guys who were in the textbooks, who were the scientists, who were the mathematicians. And students didn't learn about the history of people who looked like them 
or how people who looked like them contributed to the history of our country. They didn't see the contributions of people who looked like them in math and science. They didn't learn about um, holidays and celebrations and traditions from other cultures, which was really limiting students' uh, motivation and their ability to learn because learning happens from what we know. So they weren't able to learn because they didn't know some things because it didn't relate to their lives, their culture. So do we still need to be discussing multicultural education? Yes, it's still important. And unfortunately, it's not in place everywhere. So we still need to be thinking about it, constantly thinking about how are you being inclusive to other cultures or to all cultures in your classroom and in your school. And finally, is multicultural education for everyone? Here in Northeast Indiana, we might not have the most diverse classrooms. You might not enter a classroom that has a lot of diversity. But one, you want to make sure that if you do have any kind of diversity, that you're celebrating that and you're acknowledging that, not to single someone out, but to celebrate them. And two, if you have a classroom with no diversity, it's still important for those students to know and understand different cultures. So even if you're in a monocultural classroom setting, you can still incorporate other cultures, have a multicultural curriculum that celebrates other cultures and that students can learn about other cultures than their own.